Hello, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to today's CPD program on ethics and law in medical practice. So I begin with the opening prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for such a wonderful meeting. Lord, as we are here to learn concerning medical practice and the law which govern us, please take uh, control of this program and the speakers so that they will deliver to us what is necessary for us to have a successful medical practice now and in future. Amen. So I'll introduce to you the chairperson for today's program. She is the current national treasurer of the Ghana and Medical Association. She is a senior specialist in OBGYN. She is in the person of Dr. Mrs. Elizabeth A.C. Krenzel. Doc, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Dr. Good afternoon to you. you. I'm very well, thank you. And good afternoon to you all. And thank you very much. Today is Sunday and we've taken your, your Sunday afternoon. But being doctors, I believe that this is very, very crucial. Looking at the situation that we currently find ourselves, I think we cannot afford to be ignorant of the law in relation to our medical practice. We really, really have to be abreast with what is going on. So Ghana Medical Association, we found it very necessary at this time that we bring you the CPD so that everybody, everyone in this medical profession, medical, whether you are a doctor, you are a dentist, we would all be abreast with what is going on. So that we'll be cautious, we will not take things for granted. Times pass when people will say, oh, my doctor knows what has to be done for me. But in this day and age, people are getting more and more enlightened so far as medicine is concerned. So we also have to be abreast with what is going on so that we'll be able to practice peacefully. So uh, we are all invited. My co-chairman is Dr. APJ, Dr. Kweku APJ. So I would, he would say just one word, then we would kickstart because we have a tall list. We have four prominent people coming to talk to us. So Dr. Kweku APJ, we just say a word, then we'll kickstart the program. Thank you very much. Dr. Kweku Apeji, are you, are you there? If not, then Dr. Brifu, can you please introduce our first speaker so that we can start. Dr. Kweku Apeji will come back and then you will talk. So Dr. Brifu, can you please introduce the first speaker so that we can start? Thank you. Hello. Hello, Dr. Brifo. I think the MC has gone off. The MC has gone off. I'm sorry, but we are having a little technical hitch. So in the next few seconds, we'll catch that. The MC has gone off. I don't know why.
Recording in progress. Hello. Good afternoon once again. Let me see. Hello, good afternoon once again. Um, we'll start, I will start by introducing Dr. Mrs. Plangroom. We all know Dr. Mrs. Plangroom. She's a consultant pediatrician for many years. She has been a consultant pediatrician. She's also a lawyer who has been called to the bar. And she's interested in uh, legal education. She's always been with us. Anytime we have any legal issue, especially when it comes to medical things, we rely on her. Today, we are calling her to come and educate us on medical. Sorry, sorry. We are calling her to come and give us this education. And without much ado, I'll call on Dr. Mrs. Planju to start with her presentation. So, Dr. Mrs. Planju, you are welcome to Ghana Medical Association CPD on ethics and law in medical practice. Good afternoon and thank you very much. Good afternoon. Good, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good Dr. afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, please. I yes. can hear you. Yes. yes thank please. you very much. I actually thought I was going to be the second speaker. Yes, I also but, thought but, but, so. But, but that, no problem. Like you. Yeah, you would have to. Okay, that, that's, that, that, that's no problem. Um, Thank so, you. So, uh, Madam Chairperson, good afternoon, colleagues. I, I am so impressed that there are so many people online on a Sunday afternoon. So thank you all very much for making the time, and I hope that it will be a useful one. Um, at the first topic uh, we will start with is, um, I'm going to share a few thoughts with you on the law and medical education. I want to there's some of the things that we need to think about um, by way of outline. By way of outline, we'll look at some definitions, just a few definitions from the Ev Evidence Act. Um, I have a few slides on why documentation matters. And then we will spend the rest of the time. An important aspect of documentation is, is some of the legal, the forms that we are expected as as health practitioners to fill, um, which have legal implications. Um, I'm not sure how many, I have 30 minutes, so I'm not sure how many of the forms we'll be able to look at, but we'll carry on until it's time to stop. Um, so what is considered as evidence? Uh, we're talking about legal documentation. So we always have an eye on the fact that, you know, who knows um, our, our notes, et cetera, may one day be summoned, may be you know, um, summoned in the court of law and we may have to defend ourselves. Whenever we are doing any form of documentation, we need to keep this in mind. So I just want to share a few things from the Evidence Act of Ghana. So evidence means testimony. So obviously testimony. Because someone to come and, you know, so it includes testimonies, writings, material objects, all these things are presented to prove the existence or non-existence of a fact. So if you have a legal issue, you need to bring evidence. Now, I want to focus on writings because our focus for this afternoon is, is um, documentation. 
So the Evidence Act actually defines writing and it means, and I have a whole list of things, handwriting, typewriting, printing, photographic, mechanical or electronic recording, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and every other means of recording on, on any tangible thing, any form of communication or representation. A long definition, but I think the point I want to make essentially is that you know, we, we think of, we may think of um, writing as, you know, the notes that we write or maybe what we are typing in are electronic, but it has a very wide definition. Our recordings, our pictures, um, you know, and so I guess that by extension, even our social media communications, you know, th th there's so many channels of communication with our patients within which, and all of these have the potential to fall under the definition of writing and therefore they can be called as evidence, um, either for us or against us. Now, I, I know that um, currently, uh, you know, for, currently I think in the country we are we are we are all moving to using electronic recording systems. Um, some facilities are fully have, have gone fully electronic. Some are now making the change. I'm sure there are many that are still using essentially hard copies and papers. Um, and so just, um, just just a few comments before, but I think that the principles of documentation are the same, whether you're doing it in an electronic form or whether you are writing in a folder, we, we need to keep in mind the principles. So there are many systems being used in the country. I didn't realize how many there were until recently I was talking to some doctors. There's LIMS, there's HAMS, there's Health Pro, there, there, there are lots and lots. I think the important thing to keep in mind if you are using an electronic system, um, a couple of months back, we had a whole system on a whole, presentation on some of the legal issues. We won't go there again, but familiarize yourself with the system you are using and be very familiar with the IT people because um, we are all learning with these electronic systems. They, they, have, they have, some of them have capabilities that we don't even know about. Um, and so familiarize yourself with the IT people when things are going wrong, um, you know, speak to them. So for example, I know that in some of them, when we are talking about documentation, I know that some of the systems allow you to edit if you make an error you can go back and edit and others do not and um, some have a variable window period within which you can edit and, um, and it, with some of them the it people can actually um, can actually adjust the the time so you know we're all using different systems be familiar with them be familiar with the legal and other restrictions. The, there's a Data Protection Act, which we talked about um, a couple of months back. It's available, look at it and be aware of, you know, the Data Protection Act, for example, has a lot of issues about confidentiality of data. Um, you know, the use of, for example, sharing of passwords. Sometimes you go to sit behind your computer and somebody's page is open and you, you write something without going into your own page. And you must be aware that essentially that becomes your document. Um, so as I said, be familiar with these systems, know their capabilities and their li limitations. Um, so for example, in some of them, some of the forms that we look at actually exist in the system. So you can just go and type and then you can print it out for the patient. In others, you have to use the hard copy, in which case you may have to scan and upload it into the patient's notes. Um, so there are all these things. I mean, we don't have time to talk about the peculiarities. In fact, I'm not even familiar with all the peculiarities of the different systems, but please do be familiar with whichever you are using, know its limitations, and make sure that you, you take full advantage of it. Be careful of copying and pasting. A, a colleague of mine was telling me a, a, recently about someone who, um, I think it was some copy and pasting. And so it was, uh, the patient was um, a male patient who had a diagnosis of cervical cancer because somebody had copied and pasted and you know forgotten to do the editing. So please be extremely careful because this can land you in trouble. Now, why does documentation matter? Um, just to run through a couple of reasons, which I think should be, um, I put this in because I was speaking to some physician assistants and medical students who seem to feel that documentation was purely about so that if you are called to court, obviously that is important, but there's so much more and I'm sure that these will be familiar. So we, we document because we need a record of all that the patients, you know, everything that we have done for the patient so that we can refer to it, we can plan interventions for the patient. Um, the, the picture here is a picture of Michael Jackson's doctor. Some of you may have read the trial. He, he had one patient 
but there were things that he didn't remember. Most of us are not blessed to have only one patient. We have several. And so it's important to write things down accurately for our own reference. It's important to share clinical information with other members of the team who need to know what is happening. We know that one patient can be seen by different specialties. We might call the surgeons. There are different shifts. There's the afternoon, the morning, and all people must be on the same page. I put this here, to, which reminded me of a particularly sad incident, which um, I was responsible for, where we discussed a particular baby on the ward, and we all agreed that we were no longer going to resuscitate. And we sat down with the parents. We had a discussion. Eventually, the family accepted but nobody actually wrote it down. Everybody thought somebody else had written it down. It wasn't written on. And so when the next shift came, they were not aware of it and they kept on resuscitating and calling the mother to buy drugs and things. And it was very, very distressing. And it was simply a failure of documentation of a decision. You know, so, so all members of the team must be on the same page. Um, good documentation provides continuity of care so that all staff, uh, many hospitals rely on locum doctors who come in for one or two shifts. It's important that we all are on the same page. We know what was done before we came in. You know, I have this picture, which I picked online, of a, a young doctor looking, looking very confused. I, I don't know what the scenario was, but maybe she was told to do a tap and the tap was bloody and she's confused because the person who did the tap before didn't document that there was blood. So she's worried, have I done something wrong? But if you document clearly, you know, so we, yeah, we, we need to, you know, so that everyone who is taking care of a particular patient has the same information. Um, I believe that, the I, I'm not sure, but I believe that one day the, the idea is that all medical record systems will be linked um, and then documentation will become even more important because this information will be shared across you know, multiple platforms. Um, and it's important that everyone who's seen the patient knows exactly what is going on. We communicate with referral centers and it saves time. Otherwise people are forever having, you didn't document what you want done and people are having to make phone calls to you to say, you know, you said I should, all this, you know, so it saves a lot of time. So let's be efficient with our documentation. Um, documentation provides evidence of facts in question. Um, it's always best to write down as much detail as possible. We often hear the adage, if it isn't written down, it never happens, um, which, which is true to a certain extent, but there can sometimes be corroborating writing. So for example, if you forgot to write something, um, I saw the patient, you forgot to write the time, you made a genuine error, but there's corroboration from the nurse's notes, from incident books, um, you know, other things can be ad adduced. But it's always important as much as possible to write as much detail as you can. And the converse is true. If you didn't do it, but you wrote it down, evidence can be adduced to prove that even though it is written, it was not done. I remember an incident where one day I was doing ward rounds around 12, 12 o'clock in the afternoon. And then I suddenly realized that the patient's temperature had been charted for 6 p.m. I thought it was an accident. So I just... And I saw the next patient, 6 p.m. temperature charted. Eventually, we discovered that the, the, we had a group of student nurses who felt that they would be too busy at 6. So they decided to do some prophecy and, and, and start charting baby temperatures for 6 p.m. ahead of time. It's very easy to prove that even though it was charted, it was not done. And so we keep this in mind. Um, when you have good documentation, accurate, truthful, and common contemporaneous documented facts. It is a good defense if you are being, if there's a litigation or if you are called before a medical and dental council, your notes are all in order. Everything is written. It, it's, of course, if you, if you messed up and, you know, there's no defense, then that is a different scenario. But if everything is neatly and written in an organized fashion, it's an excellent defense. And so it's worth doing. Um, the other reason why we, we need to, be very concerned about our documentation is that um, we, we know that our documents can be called to court. They can be subpoenaed to be seen in court. Lawyers can ask for our documentation. Um, and I said to courts and lawyers, not journalists. Um, I remember again, during the Ebola outbreak, there was a suspected case of Ebola in Konfarnochi, and we were all trying, you know, met trying to decide what to do and before we could the journalists were calling they wanted information 
And then one of these journalists calls and he says, oh, I already have the notes. And then he quoted the patient's folder number. So please uh, don't, you know, people who are scanning notes and giving them out to journalists, that is wrong. But of course, you know, if the proper procedure is done and the court asks for your documents, you must submit them. Uh, in 2010, there was a, a case, um, there was this case, VAR versus Lister Hospital, which held that patients are also entitled to their, rec um, to their records on request. Um, and this decision has been upheld recently in 2021 in Jehu Apia versus Nyahu Healthcare Limited, which confirmed that patients are entitled to their records. So not only can courts ask for the documents, but the patient, for any reason, can write and say, I want my records. And you must give them whether you will, if you have hard copies, you can make photocopies. If it's, I'm not sure how it works with the electronic, but you know, but you have to give it to them. And so it can, you know, so, so be aware that not only can the courts ask for the documents, but the patients can also. Another reason why we need to document properly is because of money issues. I believe that we are going to have a talk on insurance. But of course, when it comes to things like health insurance, workmen's compensation claims, and all these things if you don't document properly you may give someone the opportunity to say that i'm not going to pay because even though you are claiming for this and that and that and that there's no evidence that it was actually done so it's important in order to avoid disputes about treatment and etc and then of course we have quality assessments and audits and things where your institution may be in trouble because even though you've done everything correctly you have not documented it okay so on this note, so th these are some of the basic principles. As I said, remember that our definition of writings includes, you know, some people like to record their notes, um, like to talk into devices to record their notes. They all fall under the definition of, of evidence. Now, on this note, um, I'd like to look at a couple of specific forms. There are lots and lots of forms that we are expected to fill. Um, and it's an important part of documentation. Um, as I said, yeah, we, we may not be able to do all of them, but we'll make a start. So before we dive into specific forms, um, a, a few basic principle, principles. Um, the first one is be familiar with all the documents you are expected to fill and be ex familiar with the ones that you are not allowed to fill. I think that there is, there are some gray areas, but it's clearly stated in, you know, that there are certain documents that house officers and physician assistants are not supposed to fill. Um, then, of course, there are some documents which we are not professionally competent to fill. So even though, even though the law may say a medical, this document must be filled by a medical practitioner, and you are a, a medical practitioner, you're not professionally competent. If I am a pediatrician, I look after newborns. I have no business going to try and fill some just because I want, I need some money to go and fill a workman's compensation form. Because if I'm called to court and they start asking me questions about disability and fractures, I, I will look very, very silly. So don't fill, fill things which you are either not legally entitled to fill or you are not professionally competent to fill. Don't just fill it just because you want, you know, there's some payment attached to it. Remember that that document, you may be called to court. And I'll show you if there's time, a couple of cases on the Workmen's Compensation Act. Um, as I said, some of the electronic medical systems we use have these forms of the system and you can fill them and print them. Some don't, so you have to use but irrespective of whether you are filling electronically or hard copy, there are certain these are certain basic basic principles. This is just uh, this is a, a, a screenshot of the uh, Medical and Dental Council Physician Assistant Scope of Practice, which says, as a consequence, the PA shall not sign a document or form required by law or otherwise to be signed by a medical or dental practice uh, practitioner. And then Section forty three of the Health. Professionals Regulatory Bodies Act also puts limitations on house officers not to sign documents which are required by law to be signed by a practitioner. Now, I do I do recognize that you know some of some of these areas are a little difficult. So, for example, we will look at excuse duty forms. If you look at the law as it stands now, as I understand it, strictly speaking, even excuse duties should not be signed. My house officers, but you know, and I think that I was hoping 
I was very happy when the register of the Medical and Dental Council was the first speaker because I was hoping he could throw some light. And it's, it's I think it's one, uh, but unfortunately, I guess that he hadn't uh, joined yet. So hopefully when he comes, he might throw some further light on it. So the document we are going to look at today, we'll talk briefly about the excuse duty form, the maternity leave form. Someone is going to speak on the police form. And again, I'm very happy because I also have questions about the police form. So we won't say, I'll probably make just one comment. We'll look at the workmen's compensation claim, disability assessment. If there's time, we might make a few comments about. So the excuse duty form, this is the old Confernochi excuse duty form. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's still in use, but if you go to most hospitals and you ask, can I have an excuse duty form, you'll get something similar to this. Now, the excuse duty form is supposed to be signed by a medical practitioner. Um, and the, the term medical practitioner is not clearly defined in the law. Um, but generally, it is understood to mean a doctor or a dentist. And so, as I said, there, there's the need for some clarification. However, this medical practitioner should be registered. And so if you sign an excuse duty form and you have not done your registration with medic the Medical and Dental Council, you may run into legal problems should an issue arise around this, um, your, your, your excuse duty form. When you're filling excuse duty forms, uh, of course, confidentiality is really important. If you looked at the form, the picture I showed further back, there's a place for diagnosis. And people often ask, do I need to write the diagnosis? And I think that the answer is if the patient objects to the diagnosis being written, you don't need to write it, give your excuse duty. Um, the chain of custody should, should be such that only those who need to see it should. Sometimes um, you find that excuse duties are given and they are, you know, they're given to some messenger and it gives it to a secretary somewhere and it's floating all over the place. So we should be concerned about confidentiality. And um, also when we are doing medical exam forms and things like that. Is there a limit to how long you can give? Um, it's not clearly spelled out but bear in mind that this is about um how how long about how long uh, if somebody's sick how long can they be a, away from work and if they're away from work beyond a certain length of time then you must have a medical board and other things like that so please don't sit down and give excuse duties for a year most institutions have policies so house officers can give a certain number of days uh, medical officers can give a certain number of days etc etc Please don't give excuse duties in working days. You see that every now and then somebody will write three working days. You don't get sick in working days. You get sick in days. Um, if you are unfortunate to be sick over a holiday, uh, too bad. You can't say that I was sick over a holiday, so I'm claiming, as you do with leave. Um, the excuse duty should begin the date, generally, the date it is filled. Um, don't write excuse. I have a colleague who did that. He wrote an excuse duty for someone who had traveled and overstayed. So he dated it two weeks into the future. And instead of waiting, she took it at that time. So she has an excuse duty saying, I have um, typhoid fever, in two, I'll have typhoid fever in two weeks. So be very careful. Of course, if, for example, you have an elective surgery coming up, the date of the excuse duty may be the date of the surgery. Otherwise, generally, it should be the date it is filled. Um, a few comments about maternity leave. We, we many of us fill um, um, forms for women going on maternity leave or paternity leave. Um, I know that there's a tendency to feel that, um, that, that we know that the ILO recommends six months of fully paid maternity leave. Many countries have gone beyond. Some people feel that it's too it's too long, and that if you um, if you give women long leaves, they will not get employment. Um, if, if you look at Ghana, and if you look at this slide, you can see that Ghana, we, we still have 12 weeks and we are down there with Pakistan and South Africa. Other countries give as much as 50. But I think it's important to recognize that maternity leave is not a vacation. If there's anyone here who has had a baby and been on maternity leave, I think you can identify with this woman who is yawning with a probably crying baby. So it's, it's not a vacation at all. It's, it's a pure period of hard work. Um, so a few comments about 
maternity leave. Again, once again, this is the Confanochi. Confanochi is where I work, so I happen to have more forms from them. This is an example of the maternity leave form. I'm told that I hear Confanochi is coming up with a policy on maternity leave, which I think is excellent because as you will see, there are quite a number of questions. Um, 57 says that a woman worker who produces a medical certificate issued by a medical practitioner or a midwife is entitled to a period of maternity leave of at least 12 weeks. So I think the first point to recognize is that maternity leave is at least 12 weeks. We can give more under certain specific circumstances. Um, so for example, if the woman is ill, medical certificates, a medic, if we're an illness, medically certified again by a medical practitioner, which is generally understood to mean a doctor or a dentist, where the illness is due to her pregnancy, she's entitled to additional leave. Um, and then where an illness is due to her confinement, in other words, her delivery, again, she's entitled to additional leave. So please, those of us who are in the business of giving maternity leaves, I'm also saying, please don't abuse this, but please also don't be too stingy. If a woman needs additional leave, please, if it's genuine and, and she's entitled to it, please give it. Um, because the law allows us to do that. Um, there are many challenges with the forms. The current, for example, I showed you the confinatory form. It doesn't, it just says give her a due leave. And it doesn't uh, it doesn't make provisions for you for you to give additional time when needed. Um, I, I'm skipping some of the slides. Maternity leave. It says a normal maternity leave can be given by a doctor or a midwife. That is the 12 weeks. So the time this was being written, there were no physician assistants. So it's for twins, can also be given by a midwife or a doctor. However, if there's additional time needed because there's an abnormal confinement, that is an abnormal delivery, or the mother is sick, maybe she had preeclampsia or something, we are allowed to give additional time. Now, I realize, for example, that many facilities now are given additional time if you have a cesarean section. And one of the questions that we need to find out is, is it only an obstetrician or is it only the mother's doctor who can give maternity leave? I am a pediatrician. I look after newborn babies. Um, and I, I would find it strange that a woman who says, I want to have an elective cesarean section because I want my baby to be born on my husband's birthday can get two weeks of maternity leave. But a woman who gives birth to a preterm baby of one kilo. So I have many times given mothers, extended mothers maternity leave on the basis of the baby's condition. But again, you know, and so far nobody has ever, most institutions have gone along with it. Um, so th there are all these questions that arise. Um, if somebody adopts a baby, can you get maternity leave for adoption? And um, we know we have many new categories of health workers that didn't exist at the time these laws were being written. So we need clarification. So one of the things I've often asked, Madam Chairperson, <laughs> um, this is to you. So we've met, I think that SOGOG, the Society of um, Obstetrician Gynecologists, should probably look at these laws and give us all some guidelines so that we are all doing the right thing. Um, police forms will be addressed by another speaker, so I won't say anything um, except to just make a passionate appeal to those who fill police forms for child victims of defilement because I've seen a number of children who couldn't have their cases um, fully dealt with because someone had taken the police form and was not prepared to fill it until the family was willing to pay. Please, Th these are one of the, I mean, the most of them, but I look forward to the presentation on police forms to understand who is supposed to pay for the police form. Is it the police or is it the patient? So, um, so I'll say a few things about um, the workmen's compensation, which is another form that you may be called doctors, um, everyone, doctors, dentists can be called to fill. This is what happens when somebody is injured at the workplace and um, or a dentist wants to be assessed. Now, we are told that um, our, our laws say that we should, we, you can be liable to disciplinary action if you make a report which is untrue, misleading, or improper. 
Um, so let me, I think that that's the main import of this slide. So when we are to make sure that they are complete, that they are true, they are, that they are not misleading. It gives a great, you know, a lot of detail as to how the, um, the form should be filled. And remember, it's talking about permanent disability. So for it's assessed at 100% capacity. Of course, we do not do the financial cal calculation. We only assess the degree of incapacity, please. Um, I believe that everyone who has, who is into doing work, filling work, men's compensation forms should have these things available to them so that you can look at them. It's quite a long list. We are not going to spend any time, but you can see total loss of sight is 100%. Um, it goes on also to talk about, for example, um, loss of sight in one eye, um, loss of a tooth. All the figures are there for you. Please, let's refer to them. Um, there, there are quite a number of cases where doctors have been embarrassed because they gave, um, you know, they gave, they gave awards which were ridiculous. And then people begin to wonder whether you were in Kahoot to the patient to get the money. Maybe when he got it, he promised you half of it or something. So let's be, um, let's fill these things di diligently. Um, sorry, I think, yeah. So just as I, I said, I would quickly mention a couple of the cases of so this was a case of a workman's a, a, a insurance case there was a woman who was pregnant um, and she lost her baby and the doctor who she was in an accident she lost her baby i think this was probably more of an insurance case than a workman's compensation but this is the doctor's assessment he says permanent disability and then he says 45 percent for core dysfunction eight percent for shifted left shoulder whatever that means 15% for miscarriage. And then he just added them up and said total of 68%. And of course, the courts just <laughs> dismissed it. I mean, how can a miscarriage be a permanent disability? So clearly this doctor was not you know, competent. He had not looked at the guidelines that are given. And it's very important that we do. A um, couple of other cases, another case where a doctor assessed the disability at 60%. And the court said, no, it's not 60, it's 40. And again, it must be very embarrassing. Um, some lots of other cases somebody injured at the workplace five different doctors gave him different assessments and again it's because they were not looking at what the law says um so um the, the courts will look at what you do but if what you do is ridiculous they will set it aside and it's very embarrassing to have your name recorded in the law books as somebody who either deliberately try to mislead the courts to get more compensation or just didn't bother to follow the guidelines. I will say that sometimes you have injuries which are a little more complicated than just losing an arm. Sometimes they are multiple, but please at least start with the guidelines. Okay. Um, th these are some of the reasons why um, people make mistakes in workmen's compensation. Sometimes they don't know about the guidelines or they don't bother to look at it. Sometimes people are just careless. Sometimes there's... They they assess, it's, it's assessing permanent disability. So if you assess it too early, you will not get the permanent, you know, it may be that the person is still healing and at the end of everything, he may be better off than you think he is. Or sometimes it's done by unqualified. There's so many law cases where people have messed up in workmen's compensation. And that's why um, I took the time to mention it. It's available. You can just copy it and put it in your drawer. So that if you're asked to assess permanent disability, you do it correctly. Um, Madam Chairperson, I think my 30 minutes are up, right? Yes, uh, Dr. Mrs. Planyu, yes, your 30 minutes is up, but we're yeah, having a little yeah. technical challenge. And that is the reason why I, I, I let you to talk so that we could admit this topic is very interesting. So a lot okay. of people have logged on. We have over a thousand. And it I looks see. like, yes, so... We are having challenges having our other speakers to log on to take oh, over. Oh dear! Oh, I see. That is the reason why I allow you to continue talking because okay. you were helping us. Yes, but it looks okay, like yeah, we have okay. one one speaker on in your name. Um, um, I don't know if if there's one speaker who is on. You know, we have uh two other speakers who are not doctors, so they don't have the MDC number to log oh, on. Oh, I see. One I see. Been, uh -huh. One has been okay. logged up, uh, logged in in your name. I don't know who, but if 
that speaker can identify himself, then we can take the second, I mean, the sec that person. Okay. So, that's so, uh, you thank you. But are you done? Um, so I, as I said, I, when it's, I, I, ha I have something on informed consent, but I can stop here if you want me to. There's no problem. I, I started by saying no, that no, no, please, I will go uh, on. Please continue whilst I check behind and see who okay, all right. I will let okay. you. Okay, we, we so don't just want to let me know. Open. Yes, sure. I will. Okay, all right. Thank then you I, very I will continue. much. Okay. Thank you very um, much. <laughs> okay. So the last comment I will make on the workmen's compensation is that it is it, we, we are allowed, there's a fee for it. And so... But if you look in the law, it's so small. So I, I don't know whether GMA has give us more further guidelines. It's quite an old document. I, I don't know whether there are newer guidelines, but they're really tiny amounts. But we are expected to charge for, for this. So, so as I, I said when I was starting, I said if there was time, we would make a few comments on consent forms. Um, consent forms is obviously a huge issue and uh, we could give a whole presentation just on consent form, but there are just a couple of things that I wanted to mention. We all know that, um, again, once again, I'm using Confanochi because that's where I worked. Um, um, they may have changed it. It may be totally different, but it's just an interesting form. We know that consent, when we, we know our consent must be full, we must give patients as much information, we must allow them to ask questions. And because we must allow them to ask questions, the best person to, um, um, to do the consent is not the most junior student nurse who just runs down and says, can you sign the consent form? So obviously it should be somebody who can answer questions. But a few comments. Um, if you look at this consent form, it says, um, I so so and so so and so consent to the operation of blah 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 and then he says I also consent to such further or alternate operative measures as may be found to be necessary during the course of the operation and to the administration of a local or other anesthetic da, 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 da. so um, a couple of comments and then there's a place for consent by relatives so I'll just make a few comments the first one is you know when a says they consent to alternative that you're not expecting and you need to take a quick decision and the question is how far can you go in these alternative measures um you, you, it doesn't give you carte blanche obviously to go in and do whatever you want and i'll just quickly show so two can old canadian cases to illustrate this the first one is marshall and curry it's an old case um, where a doctor removed the testes of, he, he was doing a heneura fee and he found a malignancy in one of the patient's testes. I don't know how he made that diagnosis immediately, whether there was some quick histology or whether it was just, but anyway, he made the diagnosis when the patient came around the doctor, the patient sued the doctor and said, I didn't give you permission to remove the testicle. And the doctor said, I did it because it was necessary. And the court upheld him. He was lucky that court said yes you did what was necessary and he got away with it many people consider that a very controversial decision so when there was a similar case in 1949 where a doctor did a cesarean section discovered that the state of the woman's womb was i don't know whether she was a grand multiple or what he decided to sterilize her and again the woman came recovered from her anesthesia sued the doctor and said i did not give you permission to sterilize me this doctor tried to raise the defense of necessity and the court said, no, it was not necessary. You, you, you could have waited, closed up and got her consent. So just to say that, you know, obviously it doesn't give you carte blanche to say, when I went into the woman or the man, the abdomen, I found this and that. So we need to be careful. The other issue is if you look on the form that I showed you, um, it says when is consent, um, it says there's a place for the patient to consent and there's a place for a relative to consent. And the question is, um, and I found that a little difficult to understand because if you are competent to consent, then nobody consents for you, then you consent. And if you're not competent to consent, then somebody else can consent for you. You can't have both. So for example, if it's a child, um, a young child, the parents can consent or, you know, so I, you know, I, I really cannot think of any situation and I may be wrong, but I cannot think of any situation where you would have both the patient and relatives consenting um so as i said parents can consent for their children um but cannot refuse treatment on the grounds of their beliefs and as i said generally no one can refuse consent 
can give or refuse consent and for a competent patient. Some of the older consent forms had a place, especially in obst obstetrics and gynecology, where the husband had to consent. And again, I think I don't, you don't see that anymore, but certainly if a woman consents to surgery um, from, from a purely legal, obviously from a social point of view, it's different, but from a legal point of view, if the woman says, I, I consent to a hysterectomy, uh, there is no one who can come and overrule her consent. Of course, it's good to get both of them and talk to both of them. But I'm saying when it comes to the crunch, it's the, the consent of the patient that is most important. Um, consent for an you. incompetent adult can be... Yes. 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 Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very okay. much for we're, we're holding. Done. Okay. All right. Yes. So thank we're, you we're very much for holding the phone. Okay. So if, yes. yes, if you can okay. end it. Yes. Okay. Thank All you. All right. So... Yes, yeah, so the last slide, yes. Yeah. So I'll leave the slides. Anybody who wants to look at them is most welcome. Um, so um, let me just say, yeah, yeah, so good documentation is very important. Um, you know, all the things, be aware of what you can do, what you can't do. If you're using the electronic system, be familiar and keep yourself safe. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mrs. Langu, for your presentation. Uh, one of the things I've learned is that good documentation is very important. You can be called to court, and then when you are called to court, it's your documentation they are going to look. Um, on the excuse duty, I never knew that we're not supposed to give excuse duty in working days, but today <laughs> I've learned that one of the things for me as an obstetrician that I still need answers before we finish this is that when someone has a preterm baby, because sometimes people have very preterm babies that they spend all the three months in the hospital. And then we don't even know what to do because we know that as obstetricians, our maternity leave, maternity leave ends in three months, then we need to come to the pediatrician and all that. So I'm sure it's one of the things that I would want you to answer yeah. when we get to the Q&A section. But thank you very much for holding the phone. Um, our, our next speaker is, I know that the registrar- Let, let me home. stop sharing. Okay, so thank you very much. I know that the registrar is on. Um, the re Registrar of the Medical and Dental Council. I know that he's on. So, uh, Dr. Divine, if you can please speak, then we know that, yes, you are on. Then uh, the MC will introduce you and will kickstart your presentation. Dr. Divine, please, are you on? Registrar. I don't know, but um, that was the information I had. Otherwise, um, then the next person I know is on is Mr. Atriki from Insurance, SIC. Please, are you on? Yes, 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 I am. Thank okay, you so much. MC, please introduce him so that he can uh, give us his presentation whilst we work on getting the other speakers. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Madam Chairperson. So our second speaker is uh, Dr. Faris Atriki. He is an accomplished insurance professional with over 25 years experience, a fellow of the West African Insurance Institute and the general manager at the technical operations at SIC and a lecturer at the, at the Ghana Insurance <laughs> College. Dr. Atriki, your audience, please, audience, your speaker. Thank you very much. Um, and let me say good afternoon to um, all participants. Um, we will do this briefly. And uh, I want to thank you all for the opportunity given for uh, me to uh, be at this um, very important uh, event. Um, I'm trying to put my uh, thing together and then let me see. Um, good. Okay, so um, this afternoon uh, at this uh, virtual national um, symposium of the Ghana Medical Association, we have this opportunity to 
uh, talk briefly uh, under 30 minutes on the topic handling insurance claims, a perspective from the insurance industry. Um, and I would like straight, straight away to, you know, uh, move into action because uh, I can see the moderator will stop uh, me as soon as a minute, you know, is, is up. So, um, to introduce, I can see that we have uh, as a team um, the ethics and law in the medical uh, uh, practice. And I was thinking that it is very important that uh, we emphasize, we emphasize uh, the essence of this uh, particular thing. Ethics being the study of what is morally right or wrong. Uh, it could also be a branch of, I could see um, <laughs> something is covering a portion of, a portion of my slide here and uh, I can't even bet ethics being a branch of philosophy that seeks to determine the correct application of moral notions, such as good and bad, just and unjust. And we now try to link insurance to the practice of medicine. Now we see that um, insurance is one area of study that encompasses medicine, engineering, mathematics, statistics, law, and a lot. But in the simpler sense, it is a simple risk transfer mechanism as it spreads financial losses among many people. It considers the, the good luck of many and share it on in code, the bad loss of a few, so that that burden, that unfortunate burden, which could be brought about by misfortune, you know, could be shared among the lot and make it become bearable, you know, on one. And the essence of it is to guarantee payment of an amount that is uncertain, which is the claim because that is something futuristic yet to come. At the time that you are, you, are, you are starting the contract, you are not very definite of what the claim will be, but you pay a definite amount, an amount that is certain, which is the premium to have this guarantee. Now there are basically two major classes of insurance where medical, practitioners, your work come into. And one is the life insurance contract. The other is the non-life insurance contract. There is what we call the health insurance. So you see there are three, the life, the non-life, and the health. The health, the name self means that it is your job. So we look at life and the non-life. Now, in life insurance, uh, you note that we need medical report, but there is a clear distinction of the essence of medical report in life insurance contracts and in non-life insurance contracts. The life insurance contracts are those contracts that have to do with you know, covering life. That's not necessarily mean that you die before you get a benefit. Insurance has evolved. It used to be the case that when you take a life insurance contract, unless you die before you get a benefit. But it has evolved such that, uh, to put it in a, in a, in a uh, let me say, street language, you can enjoy the benefit of heaven even before you die. So it has become possible that you can take a life insurance that can, that can present you benefits, you know, not necessarily you die. But the non-life has to do with all that is not life. So the motto, Equipment compensation, general accident, marine, play, and all those things. And that is a huge area. Now, the difference is that in life, you need a medical report for underwriting. Whilst in non life, you need a medical report for claims purposes. In, in life insurance, medical report usually follows medical examination. And the essence of it is to know the applicant's lifestyle, whether it's, you know, 
be it a heavy smoker, heavy drinker, or what? The health status, the medical history. It also has to determine how likely an applicant will live to or pass the average life expectancy. All this will help us in making the appropriate underwriting decision, whether we should accept the life that is proposed, which we call risk, or to reject it. And if we are to accept it, the medical report stemming from the medical examination will, will guide us to know how much we should charge. And we do that by applying a rate. If he's a very healthy person, well-behaved in terms of taking care of his life, not a heavy smoker or heavy drinker, as we mentioned earlier on, then we can afford to charge discounted rate. If he happen to be the average, then we charge the standard rate. And if he happen to be below that, that is a substandard, then we charge a very higher rate. In our life, as I mentioned earlier on, medical report usually follows an accident. And because of that, medical report in non-life cases is used for claims handling purposes. In insurance, you want to put in a claim, you have two duties. One is to prove your loss and two is to justify your claim. So if, let me take a clear example. If you have a burglary, you claim that is broke into your house, you need to use, you need a police report to prove your loss. If you are involved in a motor accident, you need a police report to prove your loss that there was an accident. Yes. And there can be some other injury cases like at the workplace that you may not need to uh, present a police report because that is not a police case. You need to present a medical report after visiting a medical facility. The second, which is to justify your claim, a duty that is on claimants. Here we mean the claim amount. Claim being different from loss. Loss is that unfortunate incident that happened. Claim is the amount you want to collect that has been admissible or admitted. So to justify the amount you want, we need a medical report. If it has to do with that level, that injury cases. Now, this should point to the very importance of medical report. And that is why the link to ethics and law is very important. We'll talk more about that. But to justify your claim, a claimant may want an amount up to heavens, but that is just a wish. The, the analysis that we will make from the medical report will help to justify that or prove that the amount you want to have is just an exaggeration. Now, these are simply some of the key areas that we've been receiving or that we require medical reports for claims handling purposes. Also insurance claim. That is one of the, the one of the commonest aspects of insurance claims that we need medical report for. The workman's compensation or employer's liability insurance claims, where there is a work-related injury or personal accident insurance claim or the broad general liability claim. These are all areas. There could be more that we need medical reports to enable us to progress the claim and make you know, a firm decision. Now, I want us quickly to just go through the claim process, and I'll do this one very fast. The first step when there is a claim or a loss is that the insured or the claimant will have to notify the insurer. Claims notification is simply communicating what has happened you know, to the insurer. And we do this through um, the appropriate means. You make a call, but certainly there will be the need for you to fill a form we call the claims notification form. In short, claims form. Now, when this claim form is completed, there must be some relevant documents that are attached. If it is stemming from a motor accident, as I mentioned, the proof of loss will be the police report. 
and the medical report will go to justify the claim. So you attack a police report and you attack a medical report. Whichever you know, aspect they arose from, be it from a general liability claim, be it from a workman's compensation and employer's liability claim, once it's an injury case, you need a medical report to be attached to it. Upon receipt of the claims um, uh, form or the claim notification form, we do a, a, a quick claims review. This is a simple thing that we do within you know, 10, 5, 10, 15 minutes. We find out whether the loss happened within the period of insurance, whether premium has been paid, whether no exclusions apply, whether there was no breaches of the policy condition, and much more importantly, whether the relevant documents have been attached. And one key document is the medical report. Having done that, we will respond to the claimant. In responding to the claimant, in many instances, at the time when they are reporting the claim, some things may be missing. It may be the police report, it may be the medical report. In many instances, the medical report does not come immediately, which is clearly understandable. So in responding, we will now humbly request the claimant to submit the medical report or other important attachments that we may need to progress the claim. Having received those things, we do what we call claims investigation. Now for injury cases, you know, we are insurers. We rely so much, so, 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 so much on you, the medical practitioners, the medical doctors to help us progress. I think, you know, there was a time that I was, I was uh, 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 looking at it that in a way, medical doctors, you help us to do our work because by giving us the medical report, we, our investigation becomes a desk-based investigation. We do not necessarily go onto the field. When we go to the field to do the investigation, it may be for other reasons. But if it has to do with the injury, and the light, you help us to do our work. And we appreciate and thank you so much. I hope the time will come when insurance as an industry will get closer to you, uh, the medical practitioners in Ghana, and see what kind of appreciation we can give, particularly to the Ghana Medical um, Association. Now, having done the investigation, we are equipped with some information. So we invite the claimant to come for negotiation and claim settlement. And there, during the negotiation, we observe a lot of things. So you may read from the medical report a certain degree of incapacitation, you know. Then when we are doing the investigation, we definitely invite the claimant. If he is unable, the claimant is unable to move or walk, we definitely go there, wherever he is in the house. You know, if he has a solicitor lawyer, he'll be present and we'll have a conversation. We do not make it stressful, particularly knowing very well that some of these people have gone through some trauma, you know, and also where the person is so ill that we have to get to the house. We try to, um, we try to, you know, gloss over certain things. But the medical report, being a document that will be on the file, must speak. And what it speaks must seem to be what actually happened. I was being careful to say must seem to be. It must be what actually happened. And what I mean by must seem to be is that if there is deviation, that deviation shouldn't look so, so questionable. And where we have consensus in the course of the negotiation and we agree on an amount, it means we have settled. It's like you settled, doesn't mean payment, but you have arrived, you have a place to sit. Both parties have settled. And then that is what we meant by case settlement. Thereafter, we issue a discharge voucher 
for the claimant to complete and submit to indicate that for that particular event and that particular claim, by paying that amount, we have discharged our liability and the claimant will not be able to and raise issues there. Now, in injury claims, you cannot contemplate what that means in signing that discharge. There have been instances, there have been instances where claimants have come back, you know, to raise issues where they wanted to have more money because, and for good reasons, unfortunately, we are talking about ethics and law, you know, it looks like it may be on different sides of the coin, and at other times it may be at the same part of the coin. The law requires that before insurers we pay, the claimant must sign a discharge to discharge the insurer from all liability and to restrain the claimant to come back and ask for more. This is because of the few bad knots that we may have in society. But there can be good reasons. Unfortunately, when the law speaks, that is it. So we could have claimants who have been paid their claim after they've submitted their discharge. And then when they get back home, the injury, you know, get worse. Or it might not have been over. And then they come and they're asking for more. But they have already signed a discharge, indicating that they are no longer going to come back and raise issues on that. So that is an, an issue that maybe medical doctors must look, must look at. We, on our part, we would always wish as insurers and claims that uh, the treatment and the recovery and everything is complete. You know, it's complete. Before we, 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 we pay the claim, unfortunately, poverty, they say, can compel a butcher to kill a cat. Sorry, Mr. Trick, we have five minutes to go. Yes, therefore. Hey, thank you therefore, very much. Thank you very much. Therefore, sometimes these unfortunate things happen. After the claim payment, we come to claims evaluation. In the claims evaluation, look at the things that have been done right or things that have been done wrong. And in most instances, who we'll look at the medical report. Now, briefly, you know, these are some of the contents. And you are the medical practitioner, you know. Uh, brief on the incident, initial complaint injury, immediate effects of injuries, examination and findings, treatment and response, rate and state of recovery, residual injuries, present complaints, degree of incapacitation and disability, degree of disfigurement and opinion. Now, these are some of the observations we made. Sometimes it happened that, and that doesn't cut across board. In, in about 80, 85% of the cases, we get what we want. But in about 15% to 20% of the cases, which I think is high, if it has to do with medical report, we tend to have reports that we, 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 we think uh, uh, it's a bit below expectation. And those are some of the observations that I want to uh, quickly discuss. Sometimes our, our, our claims handlers have complained that when it, when, it, when it has to do with certain class of people, the report tend to be too scanty. They mention that foreigners, usually they get detailed report you know, and some reports tend to be occasionally so scanty that it does not provide enough information for claims analysis. There are instances to where we tend to have inconsistencies. As I was saying that if you look at, if you look at the uh, person sitting before you, you know, you know, during claims investigation and claims negotiation, as against the medical report that was written, we tend to feel a sense of some exaggeration. Few doctors do this, but like I said, few can destroy the lot. And occasionally, we are not medical doctors, but we all know you medical doctors, you have your medical terms. But when you are communicating to, to, to others who are not in your field, occasionally, sometimes we tend to have instances where the language is so technical or complex, the aspect that we need to have meaning to be able to make analysis is such that we may have to seek clarification from somewhere to have it. Then also, we sometimes have issues where the person who is who treated or examined the patient is not the one who is issuing the medical report. 
We think this is not good if we are talking about ethics here. You know, this is not medical examination. This we are talking about medical report following an accident. So we feel it is essential, essential that the one who treated should be the one who should issue the report. And then if in a few cases, we have complaints that people talk about charge exorbitant fees. I don't want to talk more about that. And then, and then, um, as a medical report, I, I was listening to Dr. Plagru. Um, we, we are not aware whether um, when these medical reports are done, um, whether the uh, um, uh, applicant or the claimant, you know, is made to fill a consent form. If it does not, we want to suggest that that happens because a time can come when it can raise legal issues, since we are talking about ethics and law. So even when a, claim, a, a claimant comes and wants a, a medical report, it is very essential that we let that claimant fill a consent form such that whatever is found out can be disclosed to the insurance company, and we think that is all. And then claims fraud, you know, this happens a lot. We've had instances across the country where people who, as a matter of fact, two ways, who are not medical doctors try to fill complete claims form. But that is not what we want to talk about. But we are rather talking about those who are medical doctors who exaggerate a claim. In fact, an exaggerated claim is a fraudulent claim. And when that is done, you risk a situation where the claimant may fail to get his claim because he submitted an exaggerated or a fraudulent uh, 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 claim. We, we, we also have observed instances where, as I said, not enough information is given. And that is so because um, we have a situation where you may have you may have indicated that there was a level of disability. But we in insurance, depending upon the type of disability, we pay accordingly. So they could have a situation where the disability is permanent. By our definition, if the one is incapable of doing what he usually ordinarily does for a period of a year, 54 weeks then we can easily consider that as permanent. It used to be 104 weeks, two years, but it's now about 54 weeks, you know. So um, it is essential that if we are, we are helped, you aid us by indicating from your own experience that this disability will be temporary. It will be over. Yes, today it's like this, but it's not going to be permanent then we'll know how we we'll, 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 we'll let that as an input. Then it, with some, it can be total, not the whole body, but part of the body. Or it could be partial, the same hand. It could be the whole hand that is affected, or it could be just part of it. It could be the whole body or part of it. We really need to know that distinction between permanent versus temporary and total versus partial disability. It helps us a lot. And this will indicate the likelihood of uh, uh, what the future will be. Then disformity and disfigurement. When you have a percent, a degree of incapacitation, you know, for and, and that has to do with you know incapacitation. But then at the same time, that same patient can also have disfigurement or deformity. We think that it is essential that. Um, most, I say, of the doctor, 80 percent will get it right. However, in a few instances, we have situation where if we look at how it is put together, um, I mean, raise these questions. We have sometimes thought some of those things were done by fake doctors and we followed up only to realize that it was done by deformity and disability, definitely a different thing. The percentage has to... So in conclusion, please. Please, in uh, conclusion. Okay, okay. So, to conclude, uh, uh, we need to have standard... We need to employ standardization. You know, medical reporting guide for insurance claims is essential. The doctor who treated the person should be the one who should provide the medical doctor and where the facility is big, Maybe the medical doctor should sign, the administrator too should sign. Where there is opinion, 
we suggest them as the based on objective and formal assessment. There is always also the need for enough information to enable recipients such as claims handlers, you know, form a well-informed and balanced view and to, to decide on future action. So together, if we go by this, we can help uphold the ethics and law in our professional dealings. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Tricky, for this enlightenment that you've given us. Yes, it's important. I mean, it's important that we have good documentation because from what you are saying, it means that if we don't have proper documentation that, we, that, that we've learned, then someone can have a good situation, but because of our poor documentation, we will not be able to help our patient. So like the emphasis is going, is documentation, documentation, documentation. So thank you very much. Colleagues, if you can please put your questions in the Q&A section. I've seen that some people have put their questions there. And when you go, you realize that uh, the first speaker, Dr. Mrs. Planju, has started uh, answering some of the questions. Very, very important questions have been put there and she's answering them. So I'll plead on Mr. Tricky to go to the Q&A section and see if he can please answer some of the questions for us because we still have two speakers and they are all very important. We might not be able to go through all the questions one after the other. So if you can please put your questions there right now, then the speakers will start answering the questions for us. Our next speaker, who was supposed to be the first speaker, is our own registrar. And he's our own registrar in the person of Dr. Divine Indombi Banjubala. I'm, I'm really struggling to pronounce the name, but we affectionately call him Dr. Divine. Dr. Divine, you are very welcome to this GMACPD. He's a registrar and he's also a lawyer. And I was surprised. Thank you very much, I... uh, AC. <laughs> I think that because time <laughs> is fast spent and we struggled, <laughs> we struggled to get on. Uh, I will kindly beg your permission for us to get onto the subject matter and also to say that if we can discontinue showing the slides so that I can share my presentation. Okay, Mr. Tricky, okay. if you can please discontinue your slideshow, then Dr. Divine will start his. Okay. okay so thank you very much. Okay. Is that okay? All right. Dr. Um, Dibane, have you been able to start yours? No, but I think that the whoever is in charge of the technical cutting has put it up, but I'm not able to control it from here. So, uh, because I haven't been given rights. So when I put it, they say you cannot start sharing your screen. But that is okay if the person will be willing to move it. Otherwise, I would prefer to be given the right, the right to be able to, to change them so that. OK. Yeah. Um, Technical team, if you can please uh, give the right to Dr. Divine, then he can start uh, screen sharing himself. Yes. All right. Okay, so thank you very much, colleagues. And then sorry for the technical challenges we had. Many apologies. I was hoping that I would set the context and I was very careful because I knew that we have, we're having a lot of people with technical content. So I have taken it from a regulatory professional point of view to just touch on the core principles. And then I hope that it is not too late for us to feed into the observations. Of course, we all know that uh, from a professional regulatory perspective, our primary obligation is to ensure that uh, we protect public interest by defining higher standards in both training and practice. And I think today's uh, CPD is practice related. Of course, this is another way of talking about the core things because there are implications on registered practitioners who are not practicing in accordance with defined standards. And therefore, we set standards for training, we set standards for practice, 
then we register those who have met the minimum training standard to be the ones to practice and we regulate their practice. So there are a few issues that I thought uh, I should just bring on, uh, on board because uh, today's presentation will touch on three areas. It touches on the technical competence of professionals who may be called upon to perform any of the tasks that we are, whether it is filling an excuse duty form or filling a health insurance claim or filling a, a police uh, form. Then also the conduct of those who do that to be sure whether it's in conformity with settled professional um, expectations. And of course, whether there's any obvious breach of a professional rule of ethics. So it, I'm going to just touch on that the main issues are touching on these three broad areas. So in the area of competence, I think that I'm not going to bore you, but a lot of the times we get people complain about doctors because they think that there have been either errors, mistakes made, or that we have been plain negligent. Either negligent in failing to get the appropriate consent, negligent in filling a standard form, or just negligent in our assessment before we transcribe that information, or negligent in our documentation of the processes. And I, I, I listened to part of uh, Jikua's presentation, and I, I, I was privileged to hear uh, our colleague as well, brilliant presentations, and I thank you uh, for that. Now, it is important to know that we are not talking about just careless acts that do not necessarily constitute thought of negligence, because negligence is a question of law. We are talking about the law prescribing certain standards of conduct. So medical professionals, to which persons in particular circumstances, patient-doctor relationship, you are supposed to assess somebody. And you ought to conform to those standards. And if from your failure to conform, attain those standards, you cause certain harms, then that is when we talk about actionable negligence. And of course, the three key elements of um, uh, negligence are duty of care. That is usually not in doubt because almost always, once you have a patient, you have a duty uh, of care to that patient. Then the key question is whether or not in providing, as discharging that duty, you did it in accordance with professional standards that are required of a diligent professional of your standard. And of course, if you didn't, then as a result of your failure to meet those standards, was there any harm that is caused? And remember that the cause in law, the cause may be direct or proximate. It's not always the case. In other words, and we must also constrain it to make sure that it is not also too remote. And when it comes to uh, conversations in detail and we are taking questions, I can go into that. But one of the things that I, I, when I mention negligence, I'm at pains to point out is that a lot of the time doctors think that, doctors think that um, you, you are merely negligent because you have misdiagnosed, you have misdiagnosed a particular disease condition and I want to say that misdiagnosis in and of itself does not constitute the thought of negligence. In fact, it must be established that the doctor failed to carry out a particular examination or to conduct a particular test which the patient's symptoms or condition clearly called for, or that his eventual conclusion was one that no competent doctor in his position will have arrived at the same uh, conclusions. So the key point is whether the error in question evidences a failure of professional competence. And that is the point that I just wanted uh, to make. Then another area where we have serious issues are issues around informed consent. And a lot of the matters that come before us, you will just find that if the doctor had taken time to get an informed consent. I'm not saying to get consent. We are talking about informed consent because consent, which is not informed, is for all intents and purposes invalid, legally speaking. So 
and to ensure that consent is from informed, that these three technical criteria must be met. The person who is making the decision must have capacity at the time that the decision is being made to make that decision. I listened briefly to um, Jukua and she rightly pointed out, talked about the situation of uh, a, 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 you know, uh, a, a, a child. So if you are a child, there's the general presumption that you are not competent to make health-related information, but Gaelic competence allows children between 14 and 15 to be able to make certain decisions and care will go with that parental consent, depending upon whether or not that medical treatment is permanent or not, the degree of complexity, but we'll get into the details. But when we say somebody is competent, we mean that the person has not just the authority to make the decision, but has the capacity to take legal responsibility for the consequences of that decision. So, that, so whether it is a parent, whether it is a patient directly, so for all intents and purposes, a competent adult cannot have somebody else make the decision for them. An adult who has capacity is the one from which, whom you must seek that consent. Second, the information you are providing must be adequate for purposes of that particular procedure. And by adequacy is meant sufficient, relevant information in the language in which the patient will understand, detailing all the options, including the option of doing nothing, because that is also an option. This is very important. And in Ghana, we still have a 1930 act, the Illiterate Protection Ordinance, which was put to say that if somebody is not educated, there is a statutory obligation on you to ensure that whatever document you are going to do, you read it, interpret it to the person in the language in which the person understands. And whoever is there interpreting it must also sign to indicate that they did so and the person appeared to have understood. The third criterion is that after giving this detailed information, the patient must then be assisted or this individual must be assisted in a non-coercive environment to come to a decision on their own volition, willingly. And that is crucial because if there are situations of undue influence or coercion and things like that, all those factors will vitiate what is otherwise an apparent informed consent. So please let us pay attention to that because matters have come before us and people have claimed that they were not informed that this was likely outcome of the procedure or this complication was a like, likely implication. And because of that, it, they, it raised serious challenges with the regulators and even the courts. Now, I'll be talking about conduct and ethics because a lot of the things we are doing touch on conduct and ethics. And the first injunction under our 1975 professional conduct and ethics guidelines is that a doctor must be a person of integrity and good faith. And I was very happy when our colleague from insurance industry did so because that is the basis upon which the society engages us. Because of that, it is our duty at all times, not sometimes or most of the times, to uphold the dignity and the high standard of the profession. And we owe to our patients our complete loyalty and all the resources of our knowledge and skill in relation to the deployment of medical science. 
Now, if you are called upon to do an assessment, fill a form, and you know that this examination or this treatment is beyond you, then you have a professional duty to refer and not make foundational mistakes that will create problems either for, for the end users, either for the insurance company or for the victim, in this case, the patient who may have, or the employee who may have suffered some complication. More importantly, we are not to issue a certificate or a report which we know to be untrue, misleading, or improper. And we have had medical practitioners come before us. And I was very happy when you know, uh, Jikura was uh, explaining the, the excuse duty form. We have had an instance where you have an ophthalmologist issue excuse duty of for the totality of the entire nine month duration of the pregnancy for somebody who had complicated pregnancy. Not the obstetrician gynecologist, the ophthalmologist. That we must also not issue a report to a patient unless we have personally examined that patient. This is absolutely the basic ethical rule. And if you look at regulation 12, sub regulation 2, that is what it requires of us. So when you have medical practitioners who are called upon to whether it is filling a, a medical uh, insurance form or things like that, and you haven't examined the patient yourself, and then you, you sit down, and a typical example is people asking for excuse duty. I was approached by a colleague, lawyer, friend of mine to give him an excuse duty because he had a certain tax and he wanted time to be away from work to do things like write his personal exam. And, and I said, no, no, and no doctor should do that. He said, oh, you are the only doctor who has refused. So that speaks to the point that was being made about people filling insurance forms when they don't appear to have full knowledge about the specific condition of that patient. And of course, as for the issue of getting unqualified people like um, our, uh, the last presenter mentioned, filling insurance forms, it is even a non-starter. And we have professional obligation to report all those instances. Another area which is of great concern is improper association. We have had serious situations where practitioners appear to abuse the professional patient boundaries and enter into sexual relationships. In some instances, sexual assault on patients that they were scheduled to examine. And these are very serious considerations. So if they send a patient to you requiring a certain tax, it raises serious complications when you are then in addition to having issues of the accuracy and competence of the technical component of the report, there's also an additional layer of issues attributable to your conduct or a breach of fundamental professional ethical rules. And I wish to make this, the next one is about duties of practitioners to each other. And that is very important. We have had cases that came to us because somebody has gone, whether it's an insurance company or another patient, has gone to a doctor to say, look, I went to see Divine and Divine said ABC. And without getting the full information, we jump to the conclusion that Divine must have been technically incompetent, has poor skill, or his services are so poor, or even he has doubtful qualification. This is a serious issue and people have come only to find out that when you now go into the science of the complaint, you find out that there was no basis, cause of action in the first place, only because 
the patient was told by another doctor who depreciated and sometimes deprecate the professional colleague. And this is a serious infraction of the conduct expected of us as a medical and dental practitioners. And this can be found in rule five, sub rule three. Now, we, we have a, a, a lot of complaints that uh, come to us. And once we put, I, I, I just did a desktop review and it, it, there was improper or inappropriate communication or that the person who complained, whether it's an insurance company complaining or it is the prosecution from the police complaining, it was because they thought that there was also a certain degree of lack of transparency and openness. And my first shock at this was when we, uh, I was at the Ghana Health Service, I had just set up the medical legal department. And then I was in, approached by the private, uh, a private investigation firm. And that they were doing claims investigation because somebody had claimed that he had died in a road traffic accident, had gone to the, now the place has been destroyed, but the former La General Hospital, and then gotten a, a mortuary person to fill in the form that he, he, he died in a road traffic accident and the body was put at La. Because the person had a life insurance of 1.5 million US dollars and wanted to claim it through the collusion of this. And then they used, the, they copied the signature of one of the doctors. Our luck is that thorough investigations from our part established beyond doubt that this doctor was unaware. But look at that, this private investigation firm was procured by a US insurance company to do claims investigation. Then sometimes they say the way our attitude towards the patients and their carers, arrogance, and sometimes we are frankly just rude. And that some of us do not show sufficient respect for the patients and their dignity, just the humanity. And they say we are impatient to listen and explain things to them. And some of them list it as we are unprofessional or we have conducted ourselves unethically. And a, a, a good number of them also come because they feel that clinically we have provided substandard uh, care. Now, institution, we have a number of reasons why these things can happen. Health, those of us who are managers of healthcare, please pay attention because the perception is that there's generally at the institutional level of the leadership, the medical superintendent, the CEO, or the director general, or the director in that particular uh, environment is completely disengaged from the day-to-day -day managerial and leadership responsibilities. So people, uh, practitioners who are supposed to be there come at the time that they want and leave at when they want. And also the lack of an effective system within our own facilities outside the regulatory bodies and the core systems to be able to promptly and proactively respond to adequate in our awareness of the ethical and legal ramifications of our acts or omissions. There are complaints of poor individual professional attitude, poor communication, Dr. Divine, it looks like we are losing you. Hello. Wow.
Hello. It looks like Dr. Divine is off. Um, Bernard, can you please check and reconnect him? So he was making a very important point, but it looks like we've lost Dr. Divine. Uh, Dr. AC? Yes. What if we, uh, we also take some of the questions from those enjoying yes, on you? Yes, yes. Whilst waiting for uh, Dr. Divine to be connected, if you can please um, read out some of the questions. Some of them, Dr. Mrs. Plan Rule has answered, but if you can please do that whilst we wait for Dr. Divine to be connected. Thank All right. you. Uh, okay, so for those yeah. enjoying on other channels like YouTube, uh, kindly uh, register with the previous link so that we can get your MDC numbers and get you the points from MDC. Thank you very much. Rusmon Kukro is asking, what, if the, what is the difference between informed consent and informed choice? Can Dr. Mrs. Planjou help us with this question? Uh, sorry, sir. Informed consent and informed choice. Choice. Yes, please. Yes, please. But, um, I'm not sure I understand the question, but informed consent is, is, is a legal process where you are given a practitioner permission to do something to you. So you're going for a cesarean section. Um, and you give the person all the indications and all the alternatives and all the possible complications and the person consents, gives you legal consent to go ahead and give the, do the surgery. Um, informed choice, I guess just means exactly that. You, you choose between, and I'm not sure that informed choice has any legal significance, but maybe Rosemont can clarify the question a little bit that will help me answer it. In the, in the meantime, I, I've been trying to answer the questions and there are some questions that just keep coming over and over and over again. So I don't know um, whether it's worth that I, I can address those. Yes, okay, please, please, Dr. Mrs. Ranju. Yes, okay. one of them right. I saw, one of them I saw uh -huh. that concerns me is, uh, do, now <laughs> with IVF, we are going for surrogacy. So the, yeah. can the surrogate mother go for maternity leave? Yeah, I, I so that, that, that's that. one of them. The, it, yeah. the, it's the same kind of question. People are asking about maternity leave when you lose the baby. If you have a neonatal death, are you entitled yes, yes, to yes, maternity yes. leave? And then the question of surrogacy. Some people are asking, is the surrogate entitled to maternity leave? Can both the surrogates and the um, contracting mother get maternity leave? Clearly, at the time when the Labour Act was written, none of these were issues. And therefore, there, there's nothing in the law that, that covers it. So I think that, I mean, certainly, for example, the issue of neonatal death, I'm not sure that you'd be entitled to 12 weeks of maternity leave, but you will be entitled to some compassionate leave. Um, so I think that uh, for, for many of these laws, they are outdated. And maybe GMA, we, we should take up responsibility to advocate for a review of some of these laws so that um, there's clarity. Okay, it seems Dr. Divine is back. Thank oh, you very much, Jikua. Okay. Oh, okay. Holding the phone. Okay. <laughs> yeah. holding the Dr. Divine, you are welcome back. <laughs> Thank you. So the issues at the individual level, the one that concerns us greatly is serious concern about monetary considerations overshadowing professionalism. And that is a thing that worries us from the regulatory perspective. And we have been in engagement with the GMA. We hope that conversations like this are important, fora like this are important for us to have frank conversations about what we can do. So at the level of the institutions, we think that a proper redress mechanism will be helpful. That is less likely to be as adversarial as going to court or coming before a professional regulator is. So that it affords various health institutions the opportunity to learn lessons, especially the near missing misses that happen in our system. And then we then have the opportunity to act in partnership with the patients and all those who are interested in you know, reducing adverse occurrences. We will hope that 
the leadership of our healthcare institutions and facilities will be much more engaged and responsible with a set of strategies to address the culture of tolerance for poor standards. We think that quality of care should be something that is non-negotiable at, at every level. And of course, if we were to develop and disseminate policy uh, protocols and guidelines on how in our various institutions, the mechanisms we have for dealing with people who are dissatisfied with our services, then that would be helpful. But one thing that I will encourage every manager of the healthcare system is that you should try and keep routine records of when things have gone wrong and quantify them. Look at the monetary component of it and its impact on the organizational reputation and the finances. Because even at the healthcare level, I have never seen a, an annual health budget that includes compensation for persons who have become victims of medical misadventure. At the individual level, we hope that more awareness creation on ethical legal ramifications of our eyes on emissions will be helpful. And that we have to enforce a duty of candor, of honesty and openness when we engage our patients. And as uh, Jekua, uh, you know, uh, uh, she made a fantastic point. Good or effective communication is no substitute. In fact, we must always remember to be considerate, not only with the patient, but also with the relatives and carers and all others who are close to the patient and be very sensitive and supportive in providing information, including information after the patient has died. In fact, somebody's complaint was entirely premised on the fact that post the death of the person's relative, the lack of sensitivity and care and poor communication that attended that was the reason why the person felt so unhappy and came to make a full complaint against the medical team and the hospital. Now, at the professional level, we will still hope that you continue to treat all of us because we are all potential patients with the needed respect and dignity. And where you have made a mistake, please promptly apologize and fully explain the likely short-term and long-term effects of your mistake on the patient. That is absolutely important. And we are called upon to be professional in our attitude and our conduct always, not sometimes. This, when it comes to issues of medical certificate, on the certificate is written medical officer. So as a matter of law, section 43 of the Health Professions Regulatory Bodies Act is what confers practice rights. And physician assistant and, and house officers do not qualify to sign forms required by law to be signed by medical or dental officers. Because these practitioners are not independent practitioners. They do so under the supervision of others. So we have to be clear. Then, colleagues, when you are uncertain, either following an unexpected outcome or when you are in a dilemma, please seek advice from other colleagues and senior practitioners. This may save you a lot. So the way I wish to conclude because the technical conversations will lead us is that there, there's a worrying increase in complaints about the technical competence the professionalism, conduct, and ethical behavior of all of us as practitioners. And these 
kinds of complaints therefore call for these kinds of engagement so that from a regulatory perspective, we may better guide the professions that we regulate and other to better protect the general public on whose behalf we have been set up. I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Divine. You've said it all. You've said it all because we realize that uh, the times that we find ourselves in is not the time that, that my doctor knows it all. Now our patients are more intelligent and as such they know, they also know what uh, they want. So it's up to us to take up our responsibility. Society expects us to be very professional and very competent in what we do. And for that reason, they've given us a lot of responsibility. And with every responsibility, there's an obligation on us. And today, Dr. Divine has said it all. I think we all have to take what he has told us and we all, we all have to, um, I mean, think about it and practice it. One of the things that stood up out for me is for us to quickly apologize. If something happens and you think that the patient is not uh, very happy with you, quickly apologize. And saying I'm sorry sometimes will kill everything. You, uh, and uh, even if the patient is angry or the relatives are angry, the fact that you apologize, it doesn't mean you are wrong, but at least you are being human. Because like he rightly said, one day you don't know when you are going to be a patient. And the way you treat someone is the way you are going to be treated. So, Dr. Divine, thank you very much for this insightful uh, information that you've given us. Um, we'll call on the last speaker. So, MC, can you please introduce the last person so that after that, then we can go on quickly to the Q&A. But Dr. Divine, if you can please go on the Q&A section and answer some of the questions for us, we'll be most grateful. Thank you very much. Thank you, too. Thank you. All right. So... Our next speaker is Mr. Sylvester Asare Esquire. He is a superintendent officer of the Ghana Police Service and the current director of the Legal and Prosecu Prosecution Department of the CID headquarters. He offers legal advice to the Director General of the CID of the Police uh, of the Ghana Police Service, and he has a wide experience in both policing, both locally and internationally. He is a member of the International Security Documents Examiner. Mr. Sylvester. Hello, Mr. Sylvester. Hello. Technical desk, is Mr. Sylvester on? Because now they are coming on with, because he's not a doctor, they are coming on in our names. So it's difficult for us to see. So if you can please check and let us know. Whilst we go back on to Dr. Mrs. Planjou, you were answering some of the questions. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I was, yeah. So I was, I was saying some questions keep, I've tried to answer a lot of the questions in the chat, but some questions keep coming up. Um, one of them is the issue, uh, we, we mentioned surrogacy, and I was saying that um, the same question about if the mother delivers and does not, have, the baby dies, is she entitled to maternity leave? These are all things that the law is silent on. Um, for surrogacy, clearly at the time when the law was written, it was not an issue. And so I think that for those ones, um, perhaps the best, thing would be the law makes provisions for compassionate leave and so you could ask for compassionate leave and um, if, if a surrogate um, has handed the baby over to the contracting mother um, I'm not sure that she could ask for 12 weeks of maternity leave when there's no baby similar to the woman who loses her baby so I think that I was no, just that, saying that, that I think that's that, Mrs. Yes. on that one we are referring uh -huh. to the contracting mother mm -hmm. The, the recipient, the one who is receiving the baby. Yes, I'm saying that there have been about four questions on surrogacy. Some people are asking uh -huh. whether 
both the surrogate mother and the contracting mother can have oh, maternity okay. leave. Okay. So I, I okay. was just making the general point that it's a play, it's a whole area where the law is silent because um, it's it's a relatively relatively new thing, and so the law is totally silent. Um, and so I would think that. It, it, uh, let, let me just say the law is silent. So I guess it would be case by case. If you if you were a surrogate mother, you were never pregnant, but you got a baby, your case would be similar to the woman who adopts a baby, perhaps. Um, and you would have to go and see your employers and have a discussion with them because the, the law is silent on it, on all these things. Then the, the other one that keeps coming up is the issue of excuse duty um, for parents whose children are sick. I think we must have had that question in about six different times. Uh, it's a difficult one uh, because strictly speaking, an excuse duty is given to the sick person and not for the sick person to go and look after someone. Somebody also asked not just about sick children, but also asked what about if you have a relative who is sick and you need to go and look after them, can you get an excuse duty? And my understanding of the way the, the law is phrased is that no, you cannot. So again, but you can go and talk to your employer and say, look, this is the situation. So I guess from a purely legal point of view, the best thing would be to ask for compassionate leave for you to go and take care of your child who is ill or your husband who is ill or something like that. Um, I have given excuse duties for mothers for a very long time. I know in Comfortology, for example, they used to accept it, but somewhere along the line, they said they were no longer accepting excuse duties. So ask for compassionate leave. Um, and then another very interesting one that came up, if I still have time, is there was someone raised the question about if on the, you know how on the electronic platforms, you're doing rounds with your boss and your boss, uh, you have a discussion of a patient um, and then the boss says, okay, let's do A, B, C, D, E. And so you type it into your, under your name. If a problem arises, who bears liability for the problem? I thought that was a very interesting question. Um, I don't, I'm not sure I have the full answers, but I, my thoughts would be that in general, house, house, house officers who are working under supervision generally do not carry liability. So, you know, if you're a house officer and you make an error, it's the person who is supervising you or who's supposed to be supervising you who carries um, the, the liability generally unless your house your boss tells you do a and you decide i'm not doing a i'll do b then clearly now that becomes your problem so the difficulty arises you, let's say you're a medical officer and you're doing rounds with a senior person um, who says uh, okay for patient a we are let's do a b c d e when you are recording it in the notes you must write on discussion with Dr. So so and so so and so, um, these are what we are going to do. In which case, you've clear, you've made it clear that these are the instructions of your boss. If you don't do that, then it may be a problem for you. You you may end up um, end up carrying some liability. So I was suggesting that if you are doing word rounds with someone and you are typing into the notes, and you disagree very strongly, your boss says. Um, book this patient for a cesarean section, you strongly disagree, it probably might be wise to ask the boss to enter it under his or her own name. Um, so I think that I, I haven't really thought about that, but off the top of my head, these, I think it's a difficult situation, but these would be some of the answers. But whatever you do, protect yourself. Make sure you write that it is not your, it is the instructions of your boss, so that if later on there's a problem, it's it's very clear what the, the the communication was, and then there are quite a number of questions on the duration of uh, how many days various categories of health workers can give. And again, the law is silent on that, so I think it's an institutional thing. If your institution says that maybe medical officers can give one week, if you are a specialist, senior specialist can give this amount, then then you stick to it. Um, because I, I don't think the law will go into that amount of detail. Um, uh, the, the issue, um, I'm, I'm, so, someone mentioned, I, I don't know, this person didn't give a name, so it just says anonymous attendee. But someone said that there's a court decision 
which says that physician assistants can sign police forms. I'd be really grateful if that whoever, I, I've not heard of that, but I, I certainly don't know everything. So I don't know whether okay. anyone else knows about that. Yeah. It would be useful if the person so, would give the, the, the details. Yes. Yeah, that would be great so that we can all look, read it, and then learn from it because it's, an, it's quite a gray area. Um, where, where there's yeah. some uncertainty. So that would be very good yeah. if you could give the citation. Nicole, the I, I, the I, if you don't mind, I, I would like to uh, respond oh, okay. to Oh, that great, then. great. Yes, I'm glad you are yes. there. Thank you very much. Yes. The, the, the first thing is that <laughs> it the person who determines the scope of practice of a professional is not a court. <laughs> it's the professional regulator. Okay. So anybody claiming anything no standard guidelines issued by the Medical and Dental Council has become one, a subject of judicial scrutiny, and no pronouncements have been made. And I think that this issue keeps coming. This is a matter that arose, a criminal matter, in which somebody was accused to have raped. And we have had instances where physician assistants have gone to fill forms, and it's all dr driven by you know, the money that people collect. And some doctors do the same thing. They collect the money. They don't have the sufficient competencies and they fill forms. That become problematic. So that decision, there was no, in fact, a court cannot issue a decision to determine the practice standards of the medical and dental practitioner registered by the council. We have a scope of practice document. And that scope of practice document clearly tells Anybody who cares to read it, that physician assistants are not depend, independent practitioners. They work under the supervision of medical doctors. And therefore, statutorily, they do not have practice rights that allow them to fill forms, legal documents required by law to be filled by a medical officer. Is a physician assistant a medical officer? So you can check. Uh, I, I'll be glad to get the opinion from our colleague at the police uh, headquarters. But look on the form, it's a medical officer. Is a physician assistant a medical officer? No. Is a health officer a medical officer? No. So the statute, as well as professional guidance, do not provide that. And this was a circuit court decision and the judge was completely out of uh, her sort. But the question was not subjecting either at five, uh, eight, five, seven, or the scope of practice of the PA to any legal process. So uh, council has never been part of any legal process. So take it like that. Practice guidance comes from medical and dental council. It will not come from any court in this land. That is not how professional regulation works. Two, there are questions about rights of practitioners and uh, we, all the time we talk about patients and things like that. To just to be kind to ourselves, because we are human beings, we all the human rights laws apply to us. Unfortunately, unfortunately, it is us who elected to join the medical and dental professions. So it would be odd to say that our social contract with you as a human community is that in, when disease and affliction hit, we will be your soldiers. And now ask what are the rights of soldiers when there's a war? So please, it is the wrong question to ask. Doctors have rights relative to the fact that they are employees and employers have certain obligations. But from a professional regulatory perspective, Patients are the ones that we have agreed that they have A, B, C, D rights. But in addition to that, we have also said they have certain responsibilities towards us. One of those responsibilities is that no patient has the right to come and attack you and beat you up and think that you can still have a smiley face and just treat them. And I've made this clear that, in fact, in a, it may actually be ethically required and best professional practice that when you are angry and there is an alternative, you don't attend to that patient in the interest of the safety of that patient.
because all of us, when we are emotionally, you know, disoriented, we may have challenges. Now, there was also a question about capacity to discharge against advice. If the patient is unconscious, who would then have the capacity? Well, that will depend upon a number of things. Whether the person has in given anybody enduring power of attorney to make decisions. In other words, there's somebody that the person has given the power to be the surrogate decision maker. Or is there somebody with legal authority to make decision on behalf of the, the patient? And under those circumstances, who has legal authority becomes a question of law at custom. And we will expect that if there's a careful history taken, it may, depending upon the circumstances, it may be an identified person as a spouse or the child, depending upon the specific circumstances of each case. So there's no simple answer to this question. What is important is that we make sure that we, uh, the person who eventually takes that decision is a person who legally has authority to make the decision. And if you are, is a, you are using the personal law of the person, then legally, whoever comes as the decision maker in the personal law of the person or at custom, that is the person who qualifies to make the decision. So once again, physician assistants and house officers, by law, by professional regulatory directives, do not have rights to either store certain drugs or instruments that are required that we classify them as dangerous or documents that are required by law to be signed by legal and dental practitioners. And those documents include medical cost of, uh, a certificate of cost of death, medical forms, police forms to be filled, insurance forms that are required by law to be filled by medical practitioners. All of these instances will not allow um, a, a, a PA or a house officer to sign. Finally, somebody um, asks the question that uh, if somebody, you, you require that you must personally examine the patient. What if the doctor working there has left the facility or since died? That is okay, you must separate Instances where somebody comes to you and makes a certain request for a report, for example, excuse duty, and you, you are not the person's doctor. And because you go to the same church or you are classmates or you know you use old school boys or, 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 or things like that, and you issue the report where in fact you have not seen the patient. However, if the patient was seen in an institution, there's no guarantee that one particular doctor must have seen you. So once you have the records, any suitably qualified doctor at that level for that particular tax will be completely in, in their right place to look at the clinical records that the hospital has and then produce a report on that basis. Finally, in terms of duration of executive duties, this is what, from the professional perspective, it is. Excuse duties are given generally for a maximum of two weeks at a time. To a maximum of four weeks. In other words, you give two weeks, the person comes back, it's not well enough, you give another two weeks. Anything beyond one month, please consider a medical report rather than excuse duty. Consider a medical report to provide sufficient information to guide the employer so that they are able to make a decision in the best interest of the employee and also in the interest of the business or the service that they may be rendering. I, I think I will leave it like that. Thank you. Over. Yeah, over, oh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Divine, there are other questions for you on this transgender, in, I mean, current situations, transgender who comes for hormone ther treatment, what are you supposed to do? Also on the, on the, on the Q&A for you, 
And then another one is, is like, um, I think that transgender comes first. So if you can just say something small about it, you know that the, that person is a male, the person is coming for hormone therapy to become a female. What do we do? Because it is something that will be coming up very soon. Hello. Hello. Yes. So can you hear me now? Yes, Dr. Divine, we can we can hear you now. E yes. So the general principles hold. Even in the absence of local regulations, we deal with standard professional practice. Somebody has come to you first, is this person, are you competent to do it? Second, this person is the person competent. Third, in this country, are there laws that allow for us to undertake this exercise? Is there a law that rec recognizes transgender? If not, then you are well advised to refer the patient to the appropriate area where their problem can be solved. So it's not simply about what you can do and what you can't do. So you, you must work your way out this way before you don't run into challenges. So for the time being, that is what I can tell this individual, that somebody just jumps into your office and says, I'm transgender. I want to be made male or I want to be made something. The first thing is, what are my practice limitations? Am I allowed to do that? Second, do I have competencies to do that? Third, is this person, does the person have capacity? And to, to answer that question, you must have gone through tests for capacity to be sure that this person is making an informed decision so that when the laws within your context permit and you have appropriate competencies and the equipment and technology is available, you provide it. Okay, the other Over. question is, Oh, but the other question is all the billboards, big, big, big billboards that we see in town about adverti advertisement for hospitals and clinics, and then also uh, herbal <laughs> practitioners all over the country saying all sorts of things. And uh, what is the thank input? you, <laughs> thank you very much. So I will tell you what the the the, the rules are, and then what I think or what, from a, the board's perspective, the rules ought to be and where we are. First, let me dismiss the herbal because we are not herbalists. Traditional mm -hmm. Medical uh, Practitioners Council is there to deal with that. Okay. So it is our responsibility to call other public sector regulators to be responsive to their mandates. In terms of the billboard of hospitals, where we are, our ethical guidelines are clear that advertising, and that is under rule three, a practitioner shall not directly or indirectly apply or seek professional business or do or permit in the carrying out of his practice any act or thing which can be reasonably regarded as advertising or calculated to attract business unfairly. And it even goes on to define that when you are giving a speech, you have to be careful or you are writing articles or talks or you appear or on TV or radio or granting interviews. You have to be careful not to deprecate other practitioners. And you must be modest, professionally speaking, in your renditions. And it only allows us to advertise when we are moving places. And I'll give you the specific dimensions. And remember that I'm talking about 1975 rules, which have been changed. Okay. Premises and door plates. Signboards, door plates should be of reasonable size and should not exceed 24 inches by 18 inches. The writing on the signboard or door plate shall be in the name, qualification, titles, if any, 
and the name of a specialty he or she is registered by the council to practice. It is the reason why we had to introduce recently the specialist register. And the sign was with arrows should not exceed two in number. That is if you are relocating. But of course, this was before Dr. Google, Facebook, social media, and things like that. <laughs> so we then submitted. The key here is on ethical advertisement. In other words, we allow doctors to advertise in ethically appropriate manner. So we then consider that one of the key things we professionally are all globally unanimously agreed is that not the individual practitioner, but we can allow, and especially in Ghana, when you have herbalists claiming and having status quo around their necks and talking about paranephritis and things like that on prime TV and radio, then it raises the question, in order to protect the public, if we don't counter this false narrative, are we really protecting them? So in the suggested amendment that we had to the uh, Medical and Dental Council's amendment that some groups raised uh, objections about, the legislative instrument we captured that we think we should allow health institutions to be able to advertise the services that they provide so that we can get up to speed with this confused information in the system. But all such adverts, like the FDA's adverts, have to be prior approved by the council. Of course, the amendments are still stuck in the Ministry of Health. They haven't reached parliament yet. And because they haven't passed, our law is wishful thinking. It is the reason why we continue to tell colleagues to hasten slowly and ensure that they abide by the current rules until even though we are all think, agreed that they do not serve current purposes sufficiently. We cannot also jump the gun. Over. Thank you. There's another question for you. A patient had surgery in hospital A. And there was a complication. One of the common complications, maybe they left a gauze in. And the yeah. patient went to hospital B and the gauze was removed. What then do we tell the patient as a practitioner? What then do we Excellent. tell the patient? Thank in you. fact, uh, this case came, it's in fact exactly a, a case of same facts. Patton came to us. You know, the shock we had as a regulator was that when the gauze was removed for a, a repeat procedure in hospital B, and the patient and her lawyers went to hospital A to say that you left something. Hospital A said, oh, sorry, if that is the case, can you please get us a medical report from hospital B to confirm which was the right thing to do so that we can have a conversation? What shocked us is that hospital B refused to give a report. In an attempt to cover, I don't know for whom, when in fact a patient is actually entitled in our patient charter, which is we attach as schedule six to, in section 167, of Act 851, the Public Health Act, the patient has a right to request that information. It is the patient's information. And yet Hospital B was not willing until they complained to us. And we had to send a very serious caution to management of Hospital B, who were doctors, that next time we get this behavior, we are going to cite them for professional misconduct what we call infamous conduct in a professional respect. So hospital B, you owe that patient a responsibility to, to let them know that you found this and it is as a result of the procedure that was done in hospital A. And in fact, you owe hospital A information because it is primarily their patient so that if their local practices that put patients at risk, they can take 
immediate action to address those systemic issues so that we don't have a repeat uh, a scenario. So please, you are expected to let the patient know what the diagnosis is and what the likely complications are, what the surgery you are going to do is, what it will cost and things like that. It's because you cannot secretly go and operate. Uh, so what are you going to tell the patient? That is a, another fibroid or what? For example, if it was a female patient, or <laughs> you, you get it. So you have a professional obligation to disclose. And if you don't do so, in fact, your license may be at stake because dishonesty is something that the profession abhors. Over. Thank you, Dr. Divine. And thank you very much for this answer because I'm a surgeon and once in a while, what you realize is that your other colleague will incite the patient to sue you. Sometimes we hear that. And for me, I think that I mean, is you are if you are a surgeon, you know that these things can happen to you, and it's not like you did it intentionally. So, I mean, your answer is is just on point, and thank you very much for that. The other question is um, still on on patient. A patient is in labor. You know, this labor can progress, and the patient will deliver vaginally. But the patient is insisting that you do a cesarean section. In this case, what do you do? No, I mean, in the light of patients' rights. Well, okay, so uh, I, I mean, two <laughs> years ago, so I, I was on a, a you know a program, and I had to with a a, a learner colleague of mine, and it, there was a misunderstanding of what constitutes patient rights. No patient has a right to come and detect to you what they want. They are not walking into a supermarket. We have to get basic principles right. Okay. Patient autonomy, we, we actually affirm and we insist that practitioners must uphold patient autonomy. But respect to patient autonomy is in relation to predetermined, prior approved, medically approved standards of uh, practice. So if request of that nature is now part of the indications for standard cesarean sections, then that is okay. Remember, you are not professionally and legally allowed to undertake an intervention that does not confer any benefit. So maternal request or whatever you call it, if it is a new indication accepted by obstetrician gynecologists, that it is one of the new indications, professionally speaking, then it means that it is a prior approved. But a patient cannot come and say, I have a headache. Doctor, give me DDT, because my headache is cured by DDT. And you go and provide it. The patient will turn around and, and tell you that, that you are supposed to know better. And what will be your response? So please, don't exaggerate when we say rights of patients or respect patient choices. It is predicated on the fact that it is in relation to prior approved standard practices. So if that kind of request is not settled obstetric practice, please, you are going to be judged according to the standard of the reasonable obstetrician guided by the circumstances. So that is all I can say. Every single procedure that a request is made, you don't simply accept that request because the patient said. It is because it is one of the approved options. You have explained the benefits and the drawbacks of each option and the patient then selects. So that, that is a guided choice. It is not patient sitting in, in his bedroom and determining for you what you should do, no. The profession provides the options that are professionally acceptable. Then it is within those prior determined professionally approved practice standards that the patient then exercises choice. I hope this is clear. I beg you. 
Yes. I suspect somebody appears to be talking, but I can't hear. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I had um I had muted myself, but I'm very sorry. I've unmuted. I'm saying okay, that sometimes you sometimes you sit in the consulting room. A patient, there's one question like that. A patient comes in maybe with a husband, and um maybe one of them puts the phone on the table, and sometimes you get this impression that you are being recorded. What are you supposed to do? You are, I mean, as a doctor, you're supposed to be polite. But when you, you you see that, what are you supposed to do? Because it happened to me once, and I was very uncomfortable about it. <laughs> Over. Dr. Divine. Thank you. Thank you very much, AC. Look, <laughs> politely, please, politely, uh, request them to put off the phone. Okay. It is your right. It is your practice environment. Mm. In any case, this is supposed relationship is founded on confidentiality and privacy. Now, if tomorrow the information anyway, the law is clear, the Supreme Court of Ghana has tended to speak for privacy rights. And they started in 2018 with their decision in Kubagi and Kubagi and others. And there were two subsequent decisions which says that, look, you cannot secretly record somebody and use it later. But it is completely inappropriate for a patient and their relative to come and seek to secretly record you. And I say this because you are also an obstetrician gynecologist, and I think I should share this. Sometimes, Patients come in, quote unquote, window shopping to get vulnerable doctors to sue to alleviate their poverty. <laughs> I'm not saying this lightly. No. A, an individual came to complain about a very senior obstetrician gynecologist because his wife had an abdominal mass. And they went and they targeted private hospitals. And he took the wife to hospital A and they really did not do a comprehensive assessment. Did vaginal examination, everything like that, but did not do a complete exam. Then he, he didn't get, a, for some strange reason, I don't know whether he thought maybe that hospital was also not very rich. He then goes with the wife to hospital B. Same complaint, same assessment, what needed to be done. Then he goes to Hospital C, all private in this capital. Then in Hospital C, this senior practitioner goes to do a full comprehensive assessment, which leads him to do a comprehensive examination of the patient everything, including breast examination, abdominal examination, then he examined the vagina, perineum and everything. This husband was sitting in the examination room behind the curtain. And for some strange reason, the doctor had two chaperones and, and all the conversation was going on, the doctor, and it is one of the instances we found that the doctor was so, so professional. He goes, does the examination general, comes to the breast, the patient was well covered with two chaperones, and then he examines the, the chest, covers that back, opens the abdomen, examines, covers that before he comes down. This gentleman, Across the, the doctor, quote, on the blind side, presumably of the wife, and says that you examined my wife's breast. 
and this was for your personal gratification. <laughs> because she came with an abdominal mass which did not warrant, warrant breast examination. Listen. But he wasn't worried that he examined vaginally. He was worried that he examined and the wife was, just for the record, 55 years old at the time. And this is a doctor who has been now said, if you don't pay $2 million, I am not, that is the amount quoted, $2 million US dollars. <laughs> if you don't pay, I will go to the medical and dental council and your practice will be over. It was during our disciplinary processes that it emerged that this was what this particular individual was doing. So please, colleagues, always be watchful. Not everyone who comes to see you is doing that with a clean mind. And remember, he was the one complaining, not the 55-year-old competent wife. So please, don't allow yourselves. You control your consulting room. You define the patient-doctor relationship. Just make those requests in a respectful, dignified, sensitive, and culturally appropriate manner. And it is your right so to demand. I submit. Thank you very, very much. Dr. Brifo, do you have any questions? Uh, yes, please. Uh, yes, so, so if you can, please. All right. So for also those joining on uh, YouTube, Kindly mm. please register with the previous Zoom registration link so that we will get your information for your CD points. Dr. Divine, please, with regards to dentistry, uh, are there yes. some cases that you can bring up so that those on the dental field to benefit? Yes, so um, uh, I, I don't know which area they're interested in, but the general principles are the same, whether dentistry or private. But I'll tell you something. What we find from a regulatory perspective from dentists is that patients, because of the nature of dental procedures, especially when you are using implements, they are very expensive. And when a patient subsequently falls on hard times, they're looking for the slightest opportunity to say they feel pain here. And they come and say, you were negligent. That is why their, 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 their tooth is now aching. And I'll give you a typical example. A, a gentleman comes all the way from Upper West region to complain about a dentist who had done a procedure, breach procedure for him. And that procedure was done a decade prior. He was requested to make some follow-ups. He did one or two and then got lost. In between, he had gone to see other people. And it was in two cases, it was doubtful if those people were even qualified dentists. Then 10 years later, he says now he has the prosthesis was now broken. He had ache. And it was because of the negligence of the first dentist. And the poor man was pulled before us. Of course, our investigative processes, we try to be as fair and impartial as we can, and we follow the facts. It emerged that this was somebody who just now, didn't have enough and was looking for a quick way of getting a new implant at the cost of the dentist. So whether medicine or dentistry, patients that come to us, please always keep mischief, the mischief rule, yeah? mischief behind your, your mind and deal with them in a professional manner. The good thing is that once you are professional, it's very unlikely because it's a matter of science and art. And we'll balance the two. And it will be clear whether 
you provided substandard treatment or not, because it's a matter of medical fact or practice standard. Whether or not your conduct was appropriate is a matter of professional, settled professional conduct expectations. Or whether or not you breach an ethical rule, the ethical guidance will provide clarity as to which way it should fall. So just by way of sharing from our case loads, we have so many of them. The last bit is uh, I want to caution a lot of us, especially the male practitioners. We are getting an increasing number of cases around sexual harassment and sexual assault. And in some cases, downright accusations of rape. So as in consonance with settled professional practice, if you have to examine a patient, whether a dental patient or a medical patient, please, you must have a chaperone. I should submit. AC. Thank you. Thank you very much. There's a question for uh, Mr. Atriki on insurance. I don't know if you are still on, then I can ask my question. Uh, in the circumstances of residual injuries or sequelae to a previously reported disability, can a court of competent jurisdiction order the insurance company to revisit the previously settled compensation and pay more even though the discharge has been signed already? So please, this is a question for Mr. Atriki. I don't know if you are still on, then you can please add, answer this question. But if he's not on, then Dr. Mrs. Planjul, I don't know if you are on. Uh, yes, I'm still here. It was yeah, there's a question on paternity leave. Oh, and you see, oh. yeah, paternity leave. Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, I haven't seen that one. I okay. So, like, can I can hear it? I'm, I don't. Yeah. I can give it a shot. Yes. Can Can a male doctor be given paternity leave because the wife has delivered? Okay. Mm -hmm. So again, um, I mean, I think uh, uh, Dr. Divine, correct me, please, if I'm wrong. Paternity leave is not in the Labor Act. However, many institutions, I think most government institutions, it's actually it, are given it, are taking the policy of giving five days paternity leave. And so certainly, yes, I think that you, you um, a male doctor, unless it's your not your institution's policy, should be able to ask for paternity leave. I think the recommendation is five days. Okay. Hello. Thank you very much. Hello. Hello. Aha, uh -huh. yes, Mr. Tricky, I'm here. Okay. Yeah, um, please, question. did you hear the question? Yes. Yeah, I heard the question. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, um, I strongly believe that the court can really order and we will comply. It's a law. So, and the, the, the judiciary, they give interpretation to it in their own wisdom. If they strongly feel that regardless of the discharge having been signed, um, we should revisit. And there have been one or two instances that was not dictated by the court, but we did it because we felt we, felt we should do that for good reasons. So that is very possible. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, colleagues, um, we were supposed to have a presentation by the policeman, but unfortunately, unfortunately, I think he has an emergency, so he could not join us. We tried contacting him right from the morning, but unfortunately, there's an, another emergency, so he couldn't. And that is the reason why we are going on with the question. But in the next five minutes, we'll be done with the program. I believe we've learned a lot, so we are going to ask one or two questions, and then we, we bring the program to an end. Thank you very much. So, right, so Dr. 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 Any... Yes, sir. Yes. My colleagues from the dental field, they are flooding my WhatsApp with lots of messages. <laughs> okay, so, so if you can ask one or two of the questions. All right. So they are, they are asking, uh, most of these dental clinics that we find ourselves, especially in the Ghana Health Services, they are not equipped with, say, the standard 
equipments and uh, machines that they need. Some be uh, the x-ray machine. And we also know for sure that before you do any extraction or you, as in you do any treatment on any tooth, you need an, an x-ray to be taken. So we, uh, they are asking Dr. Divine if does MDC frown on them doing as in procedures without some necessary investigations. And also with the medical reports, some, some will come with combined injuries, both of the medical and say of the oral and maxillofacial region. And they are asking who is therefore to write the mm -hmm. medical report. Dr. Divine from my colleagues from the dental fraternity. Thank, thank you very much. Um, if you can't see and you elect to drive and you <laughs> crash, what do you think should be the consequence? If the standard treatment requires an x-ray, send the patient to the nearest x-ray if it's in another region. Is that your business? Your business is to provide standard professional treatment. You see, one of the problems we have is that we begin to say, uh, we act as if we are the providers of resources. Eh? So you require an X-ray. You don't have an X-ray. If there's no trouble, there's no trouble. But if there's trouble, my question to you is that what is the standard? Your colleague will ask you, not you. There will be a, an expert witness who will be a dentist who will say that for extraction or this particular dental working on the tooth, you require standard request is X-ray. So if X-ray is the rate determining step, why do you do it if there's no X-ray? See, when you do that, the hospital is getting revenue and they don't see the need to provide you with the X-ray. But if the people start agitation that we cannot be traveling 50 kilometers just to go and get us, so why can't our hospital, district hospital also have one? So you cut connects at the peril of your reputation, your license, and your practice. Right? They say a word to the wise. The second component, if it is a combined thing, we require a combined report. Because on the component of the injury, that will relate to the part, the mouth and the jaws, we expect that the dental surgeon, the maxillofacial surgeon who has done it will be the one to be able to give us the, the technical assessments and reports that we require. If the, this patient has other conditions that goes to, for example, orthopedic surgeon, then the orthopedic surgeon will deal with his or her component. And if there's a component of it that must go to the neurologist, for example, then a neurological assessment will be done. It is the reason why, and I, I, I'm sure our colleague uh, indicated, it is usually a medical board, and I think uh, Jikua also pointed out that, our insurance expert here, is usually a medical board that assesses that, bringing on board all the competencies. And please, always be aware that your report is subject to challenge, either by the insurance company, by the employer or by the employee whom you have assessed. And recently we had a complaint, a malicious complaint against a doctor relative to workman's compensation assessment report done by a board for an international uh, uh, conglomerate. And we had to go through the process to find that there was actually no cost for that particular practitioner to be dragged to answer the question that, but the person alleged conflict of interest, bias, and the key things that our colleague from in the, uh, uh, insurance said, and also collusion with employers against him, his interests, and things like that. Of course, these were all found to be unsustainable over Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Isi. Dr. Isi.
Well, whilst AC comes from what I've just seen, uh, 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 this question I answered, but I'll, I'll answer again. In case of reports where patient was examined and attended to by a doctor who is no longer available in that facility, yes, in that case, the doctor who has commensurate competencies will be able to look at the report, the record, and fill in the medical report. But he must make it clear that this is a report based upon the record of the patient, not because he has, in fact, personal knowledge of that particular patient. I hope that addresses that. Yes, very, very please. correct. Mm. Okay, so there's another question on a patient coming on admission with a partner. Um, initially, uh, introducing the person as a husband. Finally, the patient is admitted. Uh, the patient is admitted. Patient is unconscious, only to know that the person she introduced as a part as a husband is not a partner. By the person is just cohabiting with him. And now, what do we do? How do we inform the relatives about this occurrence? I think this is an obstetric question. Patient comes okay. in with someone appearing <laughs> to be a husband. But... So, <laughs> yes. Well, uh, if it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, walks like a duck, you must take it to be a duck. <laughs> anyway, that is on the lighter yeah. side. The point mm -hmm. I'm making is that your inquiry as a physician, as a doctor, remember, it is not even in all cases that people want their biological or even their spouses to be present. You must understand that you are dealing with medical information, which is paradigmatically private and sometimes so personal that it may contain some embarrassing details. So your inquiry is about the authentic decisions. You are making an assumption of what this individual who is now unconscious before you would have liked. In so many instances, People, parents may not know the wish, the true wishes of their children. Siblings may not know. In fact, best friends may actually know better about people because people change their preferences, change their beliefs, change their value systems as they grow. So if you find that, for example, this guy, these individuals were cohabiting or they were part in partnership for a considerable number of time, you can glean from them for example, what was their religious belief like? What was the personal values of this individual who is now unconscious from the friend? What were the person's religious beliefs? Remember that when you are doing a best interest assessment, it is not just limited to the clinical best interest as to what is the right intervention to save the person's life or prevent serious injury or further harm. So you, there's no straightforward answer. It will depend upon the circumstances. If the circumstances are such that maybe they just met and they just moved in a day ago, or he went there to have a drink for the first time and the person collapsed, the person may not be in a position to really know this quote-unquote partner well. Then the person they list as their nurse of king before they become unconscious. You then can inquire from the person. So it is part of the history taken that you get information about the social and personal history and life of this person to be able to use that to ask, in addition to your clinical best judgment to make a decision in the interest of the sanctity of life. I hope that that, that gives you a framework. So that yes, is the please. broad framework. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, um, another question. Is there any legal framework regulating the practice of telemedicine in Ghana? Do practitioners need HEFRES authorization to start an online consultation service? In, 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 in the light of the world that we find ourselves in now. I mean, you will be very excited about this. These are things that she has been asking for ages. But just, okay, once again, once again, from a regulatory perspective, stick to the principles. Let me, I can't speak for Hifra, but this is what I'll tell you. It's 
is online provision of medical consultation, a health facility within the meaning and proper intentment of the HIFRA Act. I, I was part of that act and I don't think that that is it. So that is to raise that question, to be resolved by them. So I don't think so. What is important is that, remember that tele follows medicine. So it is facilitated using technology to facilitate the doctor-patient relationship. It doesn't detract from our traditional obligations to the patient in the doctor-patient relationship, merely because we are now, I'm now consulting over phone, or I'm doing so over a video, or I'm doing so online. And the last time I did a presentation on the, the role of social media and telemedicine like that, I told them, and there will be no place for you before a professional regulator anywhere in the world to say, sorry, blame the robot. We regulate you, not robots. So there is no policy. We started as the Minister of Health with e-health policy and architecture and things like that. But from a regulated sector perspective, in terms of professional regulation, there's no clear policy guidelines here on specific to telemedicine and related services. But what the general requirement is that you should have been registered with us. You should have informed consent from the patient. You should ensure that their data is protected confidentially and their privacy rights are guaranteed. And that if there are breaches, the data ownership issues that arise, the person who controls the software, you must ensure that liability obligations. It has to be clear on whom should the patient go after? Who should the patient go after when there are breaches to ownership of data and things like that? So it's the same reason why we have serious concerns, contrary to Act 525 and other acts, of people sending slides and biomedical materials out of this country without the approval of the Director General of Ghana Health Service as required by law. And people read them and those people are not even registered here. And then they report directly. And we have had instances where lawyers have come to consult me about situations where there is a, a negligent act on the part of this person. So we have labs here which are doing that. So they must definitely have local, local professionals here working with them so that it becomes an advisory to the pathologist or the chemical pathologist here, or the cytologist here, or the immunologist here, so that he will weigh it and decide whether or not, in the face of the clinical information he has, whether he should take the result or not. Otherwise, you leave people unprotected, and that presents a serious issue. And we just returned from uh, you know, California, and we're discussing this at the level of International Medical uh, Association of Medical Regulatory Authorities. And we, we are going to have later in the year a conference where a key component of it is this kind of conversation and cross-border practice requirements. I thank you. Very good question. Thank you very much, Dr. Divine. I think we've had an insightful evening. It's been very, very, very practical. I mean, a lot of people have participated because the information that has come out is enormous. And we are grateful to you, speakers, Dr. Divine, Dr. Mrs. Flanjo, Mr. Atrika. Thank you very much for all that you've done, for you've given the information you've given us. And colleagues, even though we could not answer all your questions, I'm sure at least we've been able to deal with some of the issues Choose that you've been struggling with. And what I will say is that, thank you. We have the GMA president. This program was is, is a free CPD sponsored by the Ghana Medical Association. And we have the Ghana Medical Association president on the, 
on the platform. I don't know if he would want to say a word before we close. Dr. PJ. I don't know whether Dr. Shribo would want to say a word before we close, but it's been so good. Dr. PJ, I'm listening to you. Mm -hmm. I think your connection is bad, so <laughs> no, it's, your connection is not coming out well. Dr. Sribo is not part of the panelists. So, uh, Dr. Brifo, can you give us a closing prayer so that we can end the program? So, thank you very much for your okay, participation. Then. Dr. Brifo. Yes, sir. All right. Yes, can you please give us a closing prayer so that. Thank you very much. Our Lord and Master Jesus, we thank you for such a wonderful and insightful session. Lord, as we be in our various consulting room and surgeries, kindly guide us, Lord. Give us the requisite knowledge and guidance and the confidence to refuse what we have to refuse. In the name of Jesus, have we prayed. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Amen. And have a good evening. Thank you.